his own hand And for the saved by grace There is a resting place And in a few more days
and I've watched that little body grow quiet and the fevered brow cool. I've sat beside a dying saint, her body racked with pain, who in those final fleeting seconds summoned her last ounce of ebbing strength to whisper her sweetest name, Jesus, Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it, philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it, yet still it stands. And there shall be the final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race, shall raise in one great mighty chorus to proclaim the name of Jesus. For in that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ah, uh, so you see, it was not mere chance that caused the angel one night long ago to say to the virgin maiden, His name shall be called Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know there really is something about that name. Malachi chapter 2, and um, the scripture reading is verses 1 through 6, and you can read that, but we're going to draw your attention to chapter 3 and verse number 6. Chapter 3 and verse number 6. Malachi was one of the last of the Old Testament prophets. The one that would precede him, he talks about in his book, and that would be the forerunner or the one that would precede Malachi that would take his place would be John the Baptist. And John the Baptist would actually become the last of the Old Testament prophets, taking us into the New Testament. And Malachi writes about him. And it's just four little books, uh, chapters here of Malachi. And Malachi is writing to the nation of Israel after their return from 70 years of captivity in Babylon. You remember they have spent 70 years in exile over in Babylon and now uh, Nehemiah has of course returned with a group and they have rebuilt the walls in 52 days, record-breaking time. And now the rest of the crowd is coming and they're there to, to rebuild the temple and to get things back in shape and, and so forth. And Malachi writes on behalf of God of what's been going on and happening with the nation of Israel these 70 years. Remember, they weren't all taken into captivity. There were several still left in, in Jerusalem there, and only about 42,000 returned back to Jerusalem. Most of them, believe it or not, stayed in Babylon. They liked what they had in Babylon. They liked their ways, their religion, the, the world, their prosperity. I mean, they liked it, and they stayed. And only 42, actually 2,000 returned with Nehemiah and them and, and to go back and, and do what they needed to do. And of course, when they got back, the, the remaining uh, Jews that were there that did not go into captivity, oh my, a lot of changing went on. And there was a lot of change that took place in these 70 years there in Jerusalem. And it was change that God did not like. It was change that God was not pleased with. It was change that they weren't supposed to change and do. But they went about it anyway. 
And so God uh, gives uh, Malachi here some instructions of this and uh, to write. And when you read in chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, the verses we gave you, uh, the Lord even gets on, uh, on the priest, the preachers. The pastors, if you please. Uh, the shepherds, if you please. And he tells them because they have failed to teach the people his statutes, his principles, his commandments, his ways. That he tells them, I'm going to curse you, the preachers. And I'm going to curse your blessings. Now remember, it was the priest that pronounced the blessings and gave the blessings to the people. And God says, I'm even going to curse your blessings. And you. Now, you can read about it, and this is God taking Because of all that they failed to do during this 70 years, God was quite upset with them. And they decided they were going to come up with a lot of change. And they changed everything, from their worship to their... Uh, and remember, this is when the time when they intermarried, and they mixed marriages, and it was a mess and a disaster as they disobeyed God's word and commandment that they were not to mingle and intermarriage and mix and all of this uh, ecumenical movement, if you please, okay, and all of this stuff. And they changed their form of worship and how they worshiped. And they even got down to cutting corners and, and cheating a little bit and, 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 and going through instead of offering God their best, instead of bringing to God their very best sacrifices, they were bringing sick animals and, 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 and polluted animals and, and diseased animals. And this is what they were all... Because, see, they were making changes. And they were changing everything according to the way they wanted it to be, how they wanted it, what they thought it ought to be. And God was very upset. And you can read about it in those four little chapters. And the reason why... And I'll tell you what, in the same things, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me, is going on today in America. The same thing is going on not only in America, but globally. We have drifted away from everything from this book. And what it says and teaches, its laws, its precepts, its concepts, its principles, its commandments. And we have made change after change after change to where we can't even keep up with it. And I believe God is displeased. Because it's not according to His book. And, 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 and man wants to change everything. And we've got a way, after all, preacher, we're in the 21st century. After all, we're the modern age. After all, we have all the technology and we have knowledge and we have everything. And, and we've got to get the Bible up to date. We've got to get religion and worship up to date. And we're no different than they were 2,500 years plus ago. And yet change. And that's why God comes along. And I want you to read This is where I'm drawing my text from this morning. And we're studying our series of living abundantly in changing times. Now, we preached the message a little while back on four more years, right? What's it going to be like? And what are we going to do in those four years? Huh? We're going to, we're going to build. We're going to plant. We're going to pray. And we're going to bless. That's what we're going to do. But in the meantime, there's a lot of change going on. More rapid than we can keep up with it at a faster pace than we can keep up with. So how in the world will all of this change and constant change? And I'm telling folks, we got to get out of living in the dark. we got to get out of living in our closets. we got to get out of living, uh, uh, being uneducated and, and thinking that everything's just normal and going on like it is and then nothing is happening. No, friends, it's changing so fast we can't keep up with it. And listen to what God says. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6. For I am the Lord. I change not. Did everybody get that? Let's read it together. For I am the Lord, I change not. Either you've got to believe that God doesn't change, regardless of what man says, regardless of what the world says, regardless of what philosophers say, regardless of what psychiatrists say, regardless of what sociologists say, it makes no difference. God says, I am the Lord, I change not. And man wants to change God, and it's not going to happen. Great change of God's people had been taking place for 70 years. Many changes had occurred. And I tell you, I believe today, ladies and gentlemen, we are living today, there's no doubt, in an unprecedented prosperity of technology and advancement. How many would you agree with that? 
I believe the world in which we live is changing at a rapid pace. No doubt about it. Now, if you agree, you can say, man, old man, it's okay. It's all right. It's not a problem. Matter of fact, I went back and, and uh, pulled out some old statistics I had in records. And these are a couple years old. So now think along with me where we're at today as I share this with you as we're moving towards that change. And I, I went back and I began to look at my earlier days as a, as a, as a kid and as a teenager growing up. And, and basically, there wasn't a whole lot of difference in change uh, very much after World War II and, and, and moving on into the Korean War and even the Vietnam War. We, we still are pretty much the same. Matter of fact, you've got to understand automobiles didn't even come into existence until around uh, World War I. We were still walking and going by horse and carriage. You know, didn't even have airplanes and that kind of stuff. Now Japan, China just introduced to us a, 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 a train that goes over 200 miles an hour. And if they build the railroad that they want to, they can travel from China, Beijing to, to, to New York in seven hours. That's how fast this thing goes. Unbelievable. But change, and I began to really see it in about 1968. As I graduated from high school in 68, I began to see a, a, a change in, in the direction of our country and, and a lot of stuff going on and changing with the laws. And, and of course, after that came Wade versus Roe, you know that, and, and the killing of the babies and, and, and just, I mean, just constant, constant going on. And for, for the past 40 plus years, I believe we've seen a tremendous amount of change taking place in our land. Matter of fact, let me share just a few of them. I think one of the biggest ones is globalization. Everybody now wants to globalize. We want to, we want to interculturalize everyone and bring everybody in together uh, and, and globalize. And that's what we hear about, global this, global that, global that. And we're, we're, we're headed to a trend of globalization. And now that fits perfect in the end times because that's exactly what's going to happen. That tells me we're headed for the end days. Because we're globalizing everybody into one group, one small group under one umbrella, heading us and leading us into a one world government, a one world money, a one world religion, just what the Bible says. But I see global, globalization. I see urbanization. Fifty years ago, the tolls and the, and, the, and the records told us in statistics that the majority of people in America lived in the rural. Fifty years ago. Lived in the rural. And they lived outside and so forth. Today, they are, they are uh, compacting us into larger cities. And everybody's moving out and into the inner cities. And the large cities and the big cities and the big towns. The majority of people today, according to the tolls and records. Mobility is another one, I think, of change. People aren't living in the same place anymore. I mean, man, people are packing up and moving left and right faster than we can shake a stick. you got a neighbor one week, and the next week it's another neighbor. And the next week there's another neighbor. And they're changing constantly. We see people come and go into churches constantly. People are moving and moving. Nobody, there, there's no stability anymore because there's so much mobility going on. And no wonder we're in the shape we're in. We can't stay stable anymore. Graying. This is the one that really got me. Uh, graying. Now, I'm talking about this kind of graying. Up here. I see some Snow Whites out there today. Okay? Uh, are you with me? Today, there are more senior citizens than there are teenagers. Today in America, there are more senior citizens than there are teenagers. And I wonder why. Because since Wade versus Roe, we've murdered 54 million of them. That's one of the big reasons why right there. We've killed 54 million uh, t babies that would now be teenagers and even all young people and young adults. And we continue at a rapid rate of a million point five hundred thousand babies every year. In America today, there are more seniors than we have teenagers. Matter of fact, they tell us by the year 2020, there will only be two workers for every retired senior. Only two workers for every retired senior. So that's why Austin and Aaron and Ariel, get out and work hard. I want my Social Security. Amen. I want three. I'm claiming three. Just a few years back, this is where these came from, 55% of American wives and mothers worked outside of the home. 55 percent. 
And we could go into a lot of reasons why and how come of that. And you know all of them because why? The change. How many of you here today grew up with a mother in the home? We had a mama with us at home all the time. We didn't have to worry. We'd come home and mama was there. Today we have lots of key kids. Why? Because we gotta keep up with the modern times and the change. We gotta have careers. We gotta have this. We gotta have more money, bigger houses, more cars, more materialism. So the mothers are forced to work outside the home. And then today many of them choose to do so. No wonder we have problems with our kids and our teenagers. Secularism. Secularism is replacing belief in God. Just think about it. In the past 20 years, we have removed the Ten Commandments out of our government and off of our walls. We've taken the Ten Commandments out of our schools, public schools. We've taken the Bible out of our public schools. We've taken the Bible as a textbook out of our public schools. We've taken prayer out of the public schools. And now we're being sued against the law to even mention Jesus' name in public and to pray in Jesus' name. Don't tell me we're not moving at a rapid pace. And it was no accident this week alone in Congress alone uh, pointed to the Senate of the United States Senate and to the United States Congress. We had two men, one of them being a Buddhist and another a Hindu. That's just going to allow more votes for laws against our freedom of religion. That's going to allow more laws to get us into the Shahira law and to the Islamic movement as we move in that direction because of the change of the times, my friend. I'm telling you. And we wonder why we're in the mess we're in. Because any time, ladies and gentlemen, we take God out of the equation, we're going to be in trouble. Change, change, change. I tell you, and so somebody says, well, Pastor, well, uh, uh, so, so with all this change, what is the result? What is the results? Well, let me just share it with you based on these things. While those are those that attempt to mobilize us or to globalize us, there is an increasing number of hatred against the Jews. While we're trying to globalize everybody, there's an increasing number of wars and hatred against cultures and different groups, uh, uh, ethnic groups, and, and colored and white and black and white and red and yellow, and yet, and yet we want to globalize, and at the meantime, we're increasing an increase of hatred. See? So let's keep globalizing. With secularism and no belief in God, there's an increase in crime, rape, murder, you name that, that whole scenario is just tripled by tripled and quadruple percentages in America. And with all of that going on, the homosexuality, gay, gay style is on a rampant uh, widespread movement of heading forward and moving forward here in America like we've never seen before in our lives. It's being shoved down our throats and put on us and like telling us, we tough luck, man, and you got nothing to say about it. Yes, we do. And with all of that, listen, this is a good one. And here's another reason why we have more seniors than teenagers. Every 1.18 seconds, 1 minute and 18 seconds, a teenager in America attempts suicide. Now let me give you that in broader figures. Not all successful, but they attempt it. And a lot of this is to do because of all what I've just said. And a lot of this is to do because of the gay lifestyle that's coming upon them and being forced upon them. That's one, I'm going to just do it in figures. That's a one teenager per minute. That's 51 teenagers per hour. That's 1,220 per day. That's 8,543 a week. That's 37,019 per month. And 444,226 teenagers every year in America attempt suicide and to take their life, and many are successful. We talked about mobility. With mobility has created all of this moving and transferring and going and here and there. We've created a tremendous amount of stress on the family. And we've also, we've also produced an, a, a tremendous amount of divorce on the families. It's no longer 50-50, it's now 60-40. 60 percent -40. today of a couples wind up in divorce and only 40 percent make it by the grace of God because of all of this movement and stress and mobility, going and got to get and have by, you name it, and that just could go on and on. And with materialism and all of this gain and get comes greater depression. So boy, we're doing good, aren't we? A lot of change. More rapid than you and I can keep up with. More than we can shake a stick at. There's so much change going on. So how in the world, preacher, can I have an abundant life in all of this change? 
How can I live a happy, joyous life? Remember, Jesus said, the thief, who's the thief? Talk to me. Satan has come to what? To kill, to steal, and to destroy what? Your life. Your family, your home, your dreams, your, your church. He's come to do that. But Jesus said, I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Now that word there in that verse in John 10.10, 10, the word abundantly means a more uh, abundant, it means a, a full, meaningful life with purpose. Jesus said, I've come to give you a full life. I've come to give you a life with meaning and with purpose. I've come to give you a life truly of real happiness and real joy. And you say, preacher, how in the world can that happen after all what you just told me? And I've just touched the surface of it. Would you agree the weather changes? Economics change. Our bodies change. Amen. All right, good. I'm with you on there. thought that helped you out a little bit. But I want to tell you, according to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, God says, I am the Lord, I change not. You can mark it down and bank on it, folks. You can die on it. God doesn't change. I don't care what the world wants to do. I don't care what Dr. So-and-so says. I don't care what Dr. Flu Flunky says. I don't care what Dr. Zeus says. I don't care what Dr. Spock says. I don't care what any of the rest of them say. God doesn't change. So how in the world can I have a happy, abundant life full of meaning with so much change going around on me so fast I can't even see straight? And matter of fact, here's the good one. Romans, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 25, the Bible says that they changed the truth of God into a lie. They changed the truth of God. Now watch this. What is truth? They changed the truth of God into a lie. And they worshiped the creature more than the Creator. The creature of the God of materialism, the God of money, the God of sex, the God of drugs, the God of everything that's going, the God of religion, the God of secularism, the God of humanism. All, they, 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 they've worshipped that more than they have a, the Creator, and they have taken the truth of God and changed it into a lie. You say, wow, that sounds like we might as well just dry, die and go home, amen? But wait a minute, what did I say? God, say it with me, never changes. Let's say it together again. I am the Lord, I change not. So let me very quickly, if I can, uh, it tells me i got 19 minutes and 40 seconds. So here we go. All right. What can we do to have a happy, abundant, and full life in spite of all this change? Let me share with you just three little things. Now, there are more things, but I'm just going to share three, okay? I think these are the three most important. All right. Number one. You ready? Here we go. God's Word does not change. God's Word does not change. I don't care. And, and Paul wrote there in Romans chapter 1 that they changed the truth of God's Word into a lie. I don't care what they've done. I'm telling you what God says. God's Word does not change. And if you're going to have a happy, successful, a fruitful a life, a life full of purpose and meaning, you're going to have to, and I'm going to have to, affix ourselves on the Word of God. And in the Word of God. That word of fix means to, to, to get yourself fixed, to get yourself stuck on. That means to abide in. Here it is. It means to glue yourself to the Word of God. Why? Because it does not change. I don't care of the 200 versions that are out there that are trying to change the Word of God. Paul even wrote about it 2,000 years ago. He said they have changed the truth of God's Word into a lie. And that's what the world's trying to do today. We're going to write it the way we want it, how we think, what we think, the way we think it ought to be. We've got to change the Word. We've got to get it up to the 21st century. We've got to get it up to the way a man's thinking and everything, the way we're going, how we worship, how we do everything. So we're going to change the Word of God, and they change it. And believe me, my friend, every time you change a, a, a verb or a pronoun or a, an adjective or an adverb or, or anything like that in the Word of God, you change the whole meaning and the structure of the sentence and then in the paragraph and then in the context, and that's what they're doing, and people don't see it. And they accept it and believe it. And they have tried to change it ever since the beginning of time. And they're trying to do it today. And I don't care what preachers get up there and promote, and promote this book and that book. That all has to do with marketing and sales and, and with the publishers and all of that. You see, And it's too late for them to come out and say they've erred or made a mistake. 
that's too late because they have a big name, they have a big following, they have a big ministry, they've had it for 20, 30 years, and they've got all this money in television and radio, and they've got to pay for all that, and they're not going to come out and say that they blew it and made a mistake because of the embarrassment and the shame it would bring and the reproach it would bring, so they just let it go. Shame on you. Shame on you. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Psalms 119.89, Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled where, church? In heaven. Thy Word is settled in heaven. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture, how much Scripture? Is given by inspiration. I mean, it is God-breathed and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. It's just like the flute as it blows the breath over the hole to produce the beautiful sound of a flute. That's what God's breath did. He breathed out the very Word of God we have in our hand. I hold in my hand today the very inerrant, implanary, verb inspired Word of God Almighty. It has been preserved. It has been kept because God says so. I don't care what all the rest say. That's why we're in the mess and the confusion we're in. You'd better get to the... Because you see, you know why? They say we're going to change it. we got to change it. But Malachi 3.6 tells me, I am the Lord and I change not. That means God doesn't change His Word just for you. God doesn't change His Word because of the direction the world's going in. God doesn't change His Word because of Dr. So-and-so or philosopher so-and-so. God does not change His Word. But when are we going to get that through our thick canoggins? Let me just read some scriptures to you. Are you ready? How many of you believe this is the Bible? How many of you believe the Lord doesn't change? How many of you believe God's Word doesn't change? And I challenge you to go read this in the other 200 versions. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 12, write them down. You don't have all. Psalms 12, verses 6 and 7. Here we go. The words of the Lord are pure words. Say that with me. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Verse 7. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. See, God's Word doesn't change just because the world wants to change and man wants to change it. You realize that we have new computers every 90 days. We have new iPhones coming out every 90 days. We have new iPads coming out every 90 days. All of you that just brought a new iPhone 5, Apple i5, guess what? The new one's coming out. All of you just bought the new iPhones, two, uh, iPad 2s and i3s are out and coming out. All of you that just bought Windows 7, guess what? Windows 8 is out. Can't keep up with it. Can't keep up with it. God's Word doesn't change. He preserves His Word. Psalms 119, 140. Thy Word is very pure, therefore thy servant shall love it. Do you love the Word of God? Psalms 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy Word is settled in heaven. Now God says, I don't change and I don't change my Word. Now listen to me very carefully. If this is the only point we get, we're done, we're done. All right? Deuteronomy chapter 4. Listen very carefully. Verses 1 and 2. Ready? Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you. For to do them that ye may live and go in and prosper the land, uh, possess the land which the Lord God your fathers giveth. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught or take away from it, that you may keep my commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And Israel was trying to chase it during these 70 years. And God came back and then Malachi reminded them, I want to tell you something, I am the Lord thy God, and I change not, and I don't change my word just for you. He keep reading. Whatsoever I command you, observe to do it. If thou shalt not add, it says, do it. Okay? Thou shalt not add thereto or diminish from it. The Bible is clear. We are not to add to the Word of God and we are not to take away from it. God said so. I don't care what the rest of the crowd says. I don't care what the rest of the crowd's doing. I don't care who's put their endorsement on it. I'm going to go by what the Word of God says because God says, I change not. Now, you've got to get convinced whether you're going to or not. I can't help you and change you on that. 
Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Verse 6, Proverbs 36. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. I'm telling you, all of those that are offering and changing and adding and taking away from the Word of God, God says you are a liar. Now you get up here and say, well, preacher, how can you say that? Because I just read you what the Bible said. Now you can sit there and do like Peter when the Lord told Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. And Peter said, now let me tell you something, Lord. You just don't understand. That's not going to happen. These guys may deny you, but I won't do it. What did he just do? He didn't even listen to what the Lord said. The Lord just prophesied and told him what he was going to do. And he, did, he denied it. He contradicted the Word of God. Then the Lord came back and said, Peter, I'm going to tell you again, boy. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows twice tonight. And he, Peter said, got mad. Peter said he got flaming mad. He got hot. He turned red as a, a cherry. And he said, let me tell you something, Master. I want to tell you that all else fail you. All else I will die for you. And the Lord said, Peter, you're going to regret all of this. Because just in a few hours from there, he denied his Lord three times, even cursed the third time. And guess what? The rooster crowed. And you know why the God gives us the rooster today? We learned something Wednesday night in church was awesome about the rooster. Unbelievable. God took a rooster and used it to remind Peter and all of those apostles what he had said in that Lord's Supper that he would deny him three times before that rooster would crow. And yet the Lord says, but so we could come back. The Lord uses that rooster every time that rooster crows to let us know how we have failed the Lord, how we've let him down, how we've disappointed him, how we've messed up. But oh, thank God we know he's still standing right there. Come on back. Come on back. Even though the rooster's crowed, come on back. So every time you hear Miss Eldor's rooster crow, you all get right with God. Every time you hear Jack's rooster crow, get right with God. Amen. Every time you hear Miss Reed's rooster crow, I got to get right with God. Because every time I call her house, that thing's roosting in the background. I don't care if it's morning, day or night. I'll be talking to them and in the background I said, Teddy, is that that rooster? Can't you shut him up? No, he's reminding you to get right with God. The Lord takes the dumb things to confound the wise and the foolish things to confound the wise and He used a rooster that night. Oh, praise God. The Bible says, God said, if you change my word, if you alter it, and you try to change it the truth into a lie, you're a liar. So that means all these people out here have done that. They're liars. And you say, well, that's all Old Testament. May I remind you again, he's the God of the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's the same. He's the God yesterday, today, and forever. I change not. So I don't change as God of the Old Testament. I don't change as God of the New Testament. And I'm not going to change as God in the future. Amen? Amen. Now listen, so let's, all right, let's jump over to the Revelation then. Let's get to the last book of the Bible and Jesus himself, the glorified risen Christ, the majestic King of the kings, the Lord of lords, the King of glory, is dictating to John on the Isle of Patmos. And let's look what he says. And we've got people that will sit and deny all this. And you're just like Peter. You're going to contradict the word of God. I don't care what that preacher says this morning. I don't care what he's reading this morning. I like this version. I like this book. I'm going to go right ahead, my friend. Go right ahead. Let's see what Jesus says. Revelation chapter 22. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. Now you study that closely and heavily. He's not just talking about the book of Revelation. He's talking about the book. He's talking about the canon. He's talking about the entire complete word of God, my friend. Because this is the last chapter of the Bible. And the author now is coming to a consummation. And his final thoughts, the final invitation, the final promises, the final last of everything is in this book. And the author's given his final comments to mankind. And he says, I'm telling you that he that heareth the prophecies of this book, if any man shall ask Add unto these things. God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God... Now watch this. You don't think God's not serious about messing with His book? Look what He says. Shall take away His part out of the book of life. Now I didn't say that. I quoted it. God wrote it. God is serious when He comes to His book. And out of the holy city... And of the things which are written in this book. And I'm so thankful today that I can be happy. I can have joy. I can have an abundant life full of meaning and purpose in spite of all the change around me, which I don't like and it's faster than I can keep up with. But I know God doesn't change because God's Word doesn't change. Period. You can do what you want. 
You can believe what you want. And if you do, then you see you're not convinced in your own heart and mind that God's Word is God's Word. You're not convinced that this is the unalterable day. And say, I don't care who's using what and what Bible class or study or how sweet or kind they may be, friends. If it's contrary to what the Word of God says, then somebody's out of sync and it's not God. Because God says, I change not. My Word is preserved. My Word has been kept. And you don't change it, you don't add to it. Oh, because it sounds good. And they may say, yeah, but folks... Uh, and here's how Solomon, the wisest man in all the earth, summed it all up. In, so- in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. All of you that are mad, tampering and messing with the Word of God, God will bring it into judgment. With every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, that's just a few of them. I'm so thankful God's Word doesn't change. Matter of fact, Peter put it this way in Peter, 1, Peter chapter 2, verse 121. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you, the men and the women that are writing the Bible today are not being moved by the Holy Ghost. Matthew 5.18 For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass, till all be fulfilled. In other words, God says, I'm telling you what, not even a jot or a tittle is to be changed. He said, as a matter of fact, heaven and earth will pass away before my word changes. And yet today, modern age and modern man and modern religions and dynasties and headquarters, and like again, I don't care who they are, are changing the word of God. I don't care if they're Baptists. I don't care if they're fundamental independent Baptists. I don't care if they're fundamental, independent, pre-trib, pre-millennial Baptists. Don't tamper and mess with the Word of God. And I don't care what all these other groups are doing. And you're saying, well, man, they're so much more bigger and successful than you are. Well, praise the good, good for them. I'm going to believe this book. That's how I can have an abundant life. See, looks are deceiving. Hearing's deceiving. Statistics. Numbers are, are, are deceiving. If it goes contrary to what this book says. Either this is it or it isn't. Either we believe and accept it with all of our heart, every being an ounce of energy, or we don't. There's no compromise. I don't care who, who's out there. This is a big money racket. This is a big money maker. Still the number one book in the, in the, in the world. Sold. Still tops the billions of dollars. And every 90 days there's a new one out. Every 90 days, there's a new one out. And they're saying, well, it's it's the same cover. They they put a different cover on it. They put a different picture on it. That's called marketing and sales. And then they say, well, you've got to get this one because this is the sixth or seventh edition of it. And you need this because it's a revision of it. And you need this one because it's an update of it. And we've added another 20,000 notes to it to keep up with today. Folks, just because that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it God's Word. Oh, I could go on with this. I could go on, but I won't. Oh, let's go on the second one real quickly. God's faithfulness doesn't change. Aren't you glad God's faithfulness doesn't change? Psalms 119.90 again. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. You know how I can have an abundant and a life full of life and meaning and joy, Miss Renita? Because I can count on God. I can depend on His faithfulness. Now, it's sad we can't depend on a lot of our faithfulness. Amen? Ah, it got quiet, didn't it? See, it's always great when we talk about the Lord, but when we put it back on us, it gets quiet. You better quit depending on man's faithfulness because it's going to fail you. And I'm telling you, the faithfulness of God's people today is going down the tubes. The loyalty, commitment, and and dedication to the Lord and to His Word and to His church, I'm telling you, it's changing, Tony, faster than we can keep up. It's changing so fast that they're disappearing left and right. Hebrews chapter 1 in verses 10 through 12, listen to this. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hath laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou... Now what is The works, the heavens, and the earth shall perish, but watch this. But thou remainest... Are you with me? 
and they all shall wax old as doth a, doth a garment, and as a vesture shall thou, uh, thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and the years shall not fail. A, in your outline real quickly, he's faithful in the time of trial. I'm telling when you're going through a trial, my friend, and you're going through a heartache or a test, you're going to need God's faithfulness. You're going to be thankful that God's around for His faithfulness. Amen? I'll tell you that right now. You're going to need God's faithfulness. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, you have it. But God, but God is faithful, who will not tempt you above that ye are able. I'm just going to read some verses and move on. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, write it down. You don't have it. God is faithful, by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. I want to tell you, I'm so glad when I go through a trial and a testing, I don't have to depend on anybody else but God. I don't have to worry about anybody else. Uh, I have to worry about everybody else failing me, but I don't have to worry about God failing me. God will be faithful all the way. He'll be faithful now, tomorrow, next week, next year, next millennium. He'll be faithful throughout all eternity. God's faithfulness, church, never changes. But people's faithfulness do change. Constantly. We're seeing a, 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 a going away from that so quickly. I want to tell you something else. He's faithful when you have burdens. How many of you got to have a burden? How many have a burden today? How many of you are going through a trial and a testing today in your life? Mark it down. God's faithful. God is faithful. He will not leave you. He will not leave you. He will not leave you. He will not desert you. He will not walk away from you. He will not abandon you. He will in no wise cast you out. God is faithful in your trial. And if you're carrying a burden today, I want to tell you something. God is faithful in that burden. He's faithful in that burden. That's why 1 Peter 5 says, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Friend, I want to tell you something. God cares for you today. God cares for you more than ever. Amen. you got a burden today. I want you to tell you you need to leave it at Calvary. Amen. You remember years ago, several years ago, we preached one of the messages here on a burden, leaving our burdens at Calvary. We brought in a wheelbarrow, and we pushed the wheelbarrow across here with a lot of stuff we had in it, and it represented our burdens. And then we came down the aisle with it and we dumped them out at the cross we had as we, we laid our burdens at the cross. And then some got up and went back. But then as an illustration we took and some of us got up and we put all them books and we put them back in the wheelbarrow and turned around and walked back. You didn't leave your burden. You picked it up and, and you carried it right back with you. You don't have to. God is faithful to you in your burden. He will be faithful in your burden. Now, no matter how heavy the burden would be, and I don't minimize it, let me tell you, there'll be people that will fail you. There'll be people that disappoint you. There'll be people that will let you down in your burden. But you can mark it down. God will not fail you in your burden. He is faithful in your trial. He's faithful in your burden. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Very quickly and lastly. Now these are the things we can stick with because they don't change. God's word doesn't change. God's faithful doesn't change. This is one of my best ones. God's plan of salvation doesn't change. I don't care what the world says out there. I don't care what they're doing out there. It doesn't matter. God's plan of salvation will never change. It's the same from the beginning of time. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They were the first couple and they were the first ones to sin. And what did God do to show redemption and forgiveness? God killed the lamb and shed a blood for the redemption of sin. That plan of salvation started back in Genesis 1. Genesis 3. Abraham came along and he said, God, get, Abram, get up and move, move your family and go here to a place like 10. The Bible says, God, Abraham believed God. It was counted unto him for righteousness. It hasn't changed, folks. And you and I must place our faith in Christ. We must place our faith in Christ. Romans 10, 17 says, What faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And that's why you've got to hear the right Word of God. Hello. 
Okay? Found this little illustration. It was really good. Daughter came home, living a, a wayward life, involved in all kinds of things. She came home, went into her room, and looked on her desk, and there was a note. No matter what you've done, come home. I forgive you. No matter what you've done, come home. I forgive you. God will forgive you. God's plan of salvation, my friend, never changes. We're not going to change that. The Bible says in Romans 10, 3, 10, that, all, that there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says in Romans 5.8 but God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says in Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says in Romans 10.13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And John 1.12 says but as many as received Him to them gave He the power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on His name. God's plan of salvation doesn't change. It's the same as it was for Adam and Eve and it's the same for you and I today and for anyone else who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Not in a church, not in a preacher, not in a rabbi, not in a priest, not in a monk, not in a Buddhist, not in religion, not in a denomination, not in a dynasty, but you've got to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I don't care what all the other denominations tell you. I don't care what all the rest of them say that there are many ways to heaven and there's all kinds of ways and we can all get there our own way, but we're all going to get to heaven. No, we're not. There are not many ways. There is only one way. Jesus made it very clear in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto me except to the Father except by me. There is no other plan of salvation. It's not going to change. I don't care what the world's trying to do to change it. You've got to do this and do that and join this and be a this and a that and go through this and go through that. Folks, that's not going to get you to heaven. That's not going to get your sins forgiven. I don't care if the Bibles are trying to change and read these other uh, versions that are coming out saying, well, if we do this and we do that, and, and God's going to make a little exception for you and you over here and do this for you. No, He's not. I am the Lord. I change not. God does not change His plan of salvation, my friend. You need to understand that. we got so many people think that they're going to get saved the way they want to get saved. You think you're going to get saved uh, when you want to get saved and how you want to get saved. No, you're not. Preacher, how can you be so dogmatic? How can you be so narrow-minded and tunnel vision? Because when it comes to at least these three things, my friend, the Bible is very clear. God is clear on it. And we can stand on it and be dogmatic on it, be clear on it, tunnel vision, whatever you want, that God doesn't change. His Word doesn't change. His faithfulness doesn't change. And when it comes to His salvation, it doesn't change, it hasn't changed, and it never will change. It'll be the same today, it'll be the same in the millennium, and it'll be the same in the tribulation, and it'll be the same in the millennium. One must put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and believe on Him and His name for His finished atoning work on the cross of Calvary and by faith repent of their sin and come to Christ and receive eternal life, everlasting life, and be born again into the family of God. Friends, that's it, period. There is no other way. That's how I can have a full and meaningful and abundant life. Because I have that way. I've accepted that way. I've come that way. And I don't have to worry about what everybody else is saying and writing because I know the truth of the Word of God. And God's Word doesn't change. And that's how you can have a full and meaningful life if you'll get a hold of this fact that God's Word doesn't change, God's faithfulness doesn't change, and God's plan of salvation doesn't change. Period. I don't care how many doctor degrees they've got, who they are, what they've said or didn't say. You've got to get down to this is the final authority. What does the Word of God say? And you're going to have trouble if you're looking out there for all the other 200 plus versions if you don't get the right one because you're not going to know what God says. Because the rest are interpretations. Paraphrased. Man's thoughts, man's ideas. Man's ways. Man's thinking. And even Peter says that no scripture of any private interpretation. They don't have the right to take this Bible and interpret it privately to the way they want and think. And how they think it ought to be. Period. 
And there are only five that have been transliterated, by the way. All the rest of them are paraphrases. All of them. Only five have been transliterated. That's the King James Bible, which I hold in my hand. The New King James Bible. The NIV. The New American Standard. And the Revised Standard. Those are the only five that have been transliterated. And only one out of those five uses the correct Greek. And that's the King James Bible. All other four that use the translation for the Greek text use the Westcott Hork Greek text. That is an incorrect Greek text. Now you can argue with me all you want to, but you can go and research it. It's all out there. I challenged a guy who was here before to do it, and he found out. It's all on the Internet. You can get all you want. The information is out there. This is translated out of the received text or the textus receptive. It was the same text that the apostles have. It's the same Greek text that was handed down and given to the, to the apostles, to the early church. And then it was passed on to the early church fathers and kept until 323 A.D. And when uh, Constantine, the pope there, he decided to change it and write it all. And it went underground and it was hidden. For years it was hidden. But God preserved his word. And the Greek Orthodox text, text is, 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 a, is a work out of the Sinai text. I call it Sinai text. And the Vatican text. The Vatican. Did you get the name? Vatican text? Okay. And it's got over 1,700 contradictions and, and mistakes in it. And by the way, you can go out and study the biography and the life of Westcott and Hort. They were Germans. It's not the oldest Greek text because they didn't even write it until 1930-something. How they come up with saying this is the oldest text we found is unbelievable when these guys wrote it back in the early 1900s. Westcott and Hort in their own biography. Now, I'm quoting their biography. I have it. They were beer commercial making for, for, for Germany. They were part of Hitler's Third Reich. They were in witchcraft. They were involved in the occult. And they denied verbal inspiration. And my Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration. And they denied verbal inspiration. And we're going to say that is the best Greek text written by a bunch of drunks, uh, cult worshiping, Nazis, neo-Nazis. Come on, people, wake up! If you think I'm making up stuff, go out there and search it yourself. The Internet's there, folks. Read it. Read the research behind it and the authors behind it and why were all of the names taken out of the NIV like sodomy and sodomite and all because your, your linguistics, your head of your linguistic departments is a known practicing lesbian. That's what I challenge this man that was here to do so. Type in Westcott and Hort. Go read their biography. Read about them. And that's what all other four others are translated out of, and this one's not. This came from, uh, from Wycliffe and Tyndale and these men. Huss and Luther and these guys. The work. Then the Geneva Bible got a hold of their work in 1560 and produced the Geneva Bible. That was the Bible that came over on the Mayflower that started America. They started out and stepped on land with the 1560 Geneva Bible, which was a copy of, of, from Tyndale and Wycliffe and all of their work and, and, and those men of their Greek work that they did and work, the work they did. And that was the Bible that started out in America was the 1560 Geneva Bible. It wasn't until 1611 that King James ordered a, a group of scholars, of 52 scholars, to write the King James Bible for the English-speaking people. And those men spent years putting it together to work together. And many of them died a martyr's death. That's why we have a bloodline Bible in our hand today. Nobody else has ever shed one drop of blood for all these other versions that are out there. But this Bible right here. Amen. Amen. You don't have to believe me. That's all right. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. But thank God for computers and technology. It's all there for you. Read it. You say, well, what about all these guys that are in this? Because it's money. It's marketing. And the embarrassment and the reproach it would be after 30, 40 years. And what happens, church, is like I said before, it's like starting a snowball. And start it rolling downhill. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can't stop it. 
until it hits the bottom with an explosion. And we all, wow, man, did you see that snowball? Whoa, and that's exciting. Whoa. Uh-oh. Look behind it. Look at the path and the destruction it left. All of this confusion has brought confusion to the body of Christ. And the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. So, have it your way. But God says, when you read all that stuff and you buy them and you participate in them, you're just as guilty of changing the word of God and altering and taking it from it. And he said, therefore, you're going to be under a judgment and the, th- and the curses that are in this book are going to come upon you. Because that's how serious God takes this book. He says, don't mess with my book. But man's better, knows more, and smarter. And we got our ways. And after a while, God's old fuddy-duddy. He's just an old man floating around on a cloud with a big long beard up there. And we got to get him up to date. You stick to the book. You stick to his faithfulness. You get affixed to his book, get affixed to his faithfulness, and get affixed to his salvation. You get glued to it. And guess what? Well, I don't care how much change goes on. You can have a full, happy, meaningful, purposeful life in Christ. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, we thank you for today. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. As our folks come to lead us in the hymn of invitation, if God has spoken to your heart, you might want to come and pray, whatever it is. Whatever the Lord's done, would you come? We'll just sing two verses and that'll be all. We'll be finished. God bless you. Would you come? <laughs>